the campaign rally. He will also sign an executive order there. This is another order that reviews Obama administration policies, this one looking at trade policies. ABC's David Wright, the president, is skipping the White House Correspondents' Dinner, something that's become a tradition for U.S. presidents. Vice President Pence joining Navy officials in Newport News, Virginia today to christen the newest nuclear-powered submarine, the USS Indiana. When America is strong, the world is safe. And the USS Indiana will bear witness to this truth. The sub is named for the vice president's home state. You're listening to ABC News. Hiring is the most challenging part of my job. It's really hard. The searching, the sorting through resumes. Most people don't have the right experience. We started using ZipRecruiter about three months ago. Right from the start, you could tell it was going to make hiring a lot easier. One click and my job was posted to 100 plus job boards, all the top sites. All of the candidates came to my dashboard, and it's easy to compare them. Thumbs up if I like them, thumbs down if I didn't. No emails and attachments, printing up docs, phone calls, none of that. And I couldn't believe the number of great applicants we got. I had the person we needed within one week. I don't know how we hired before ZipRecruiter. Whether you're looking to fill one position or 20, find the best candidates with ZipRecruiter, where your job is just one click away from 100 plus job sites. ZipRecruiter, the fastest way to hire. And right now you can try ZipRecruiter free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash ABC Radio. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash ABC Radio. ZipRecruiter.com slash ABC Radio. 25 years ago today, the acquittal of four white police officers in the beating of a black man sparked the Los Angeles riots. There's no police presence. In the days after the beating of truck driver Reginald Denny in the intersection of Florence and Normandy, Steve Gomez and a young FBI agent specializing in gangs, now an ABC News consultant, went to work tracking down the men responsible. We're receiving phone calls from our informants each day where they're saying, hey, you know, the guys that beat up Denny is, are this guy, this guy, you know, Henry Watson, Damian Williams and so on. Then Agent Gomez's team was able to secure warrants and with the LAPD arrests were made. During the riots over 50 people died, 4,000 were injured. Alex Stone, ABC News, Los Angeles. A successful Texas lawyer who was nicknamed Racehorse for his flamboyant courtroom style has died. Initial fame came when Richard Haynes defended wealthy Houston plastic surgeon John Hill at a trial over the 1969 slaying of Hill's socialite wife, who investigators said died after eating an eclair secretly laced with E. coli bacteria. The trial ended in a hung jury. The case was the subject of a best-selling book, Blood and Money, and a 1981 film, Murder in Texas. Haynes later represented Fort Worth oil man T. Cullen Davis, accused of killing his 12-year-old stepdaughter. The first trial ended in a mistrial. The second ended in an acquittal. Haynes died early Friday at his East Texas home in Trinity. He was 90. Todd Ant, ABC News. This is ABC News. ABC Radio presents Career Course. Brought to you by Indeed.com. I'm ABC's Chief Business Correspondent, Rebecca Jarvis, with two easy steps to building a team. Know yourself as a leader. Great managers know their strengths and weaknesses and hire those who can help fill in the gaps. And clearly define roles and celebrate success. It sounds simple, but making responsibilities clear and praising the wins is one of the most important steps to getting your team to work together. Post your next job opening on the world's number one job site, Indeed.com. Daria Albinger, ABC News. From the KMET Weather Center for Beaumont and the Pass area, we'll kick off the weekend with a wind advisory in effect through 2 o'clock this afternoon. It'll be sunny with a high of 76 as winds gust to 40 miles an hour. Tonight, it'll be clear with a low of 55 with high winds to 20 miles an hour. Sunday should be sunny, our high 82 with winds to 25 miles an hour. For Redlands, we have a high wind warning in effect through 2 o'clock. It'll be sunny with a high of 84 with winds to 35 miles an hour. For Palm Springs, it'll be sunny with a high of 88 with winds to 30 miles an hour. I'm Rod Tanner for Smart Talk 1490 KMET. The Banning Beaumont Cherry Valley Tea Party meets every Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. for informal breakfast and discussion. And they meet each month on the second Thursday at 5 p.m., all at the Farms House Restaurant in Banning. Listen to interesting speakers, learn about our Constitution with our free classes, enjoy friendly discussions, and informal dining. Come join us. For more information, call Glenn Stoll, 951-316-3843. The following is a paid program. Views and claims expressed are those of the program producer and are not endorsed by this station. Opinions expressed are not necessarily those of radio station KMET, its management, employees, or affiliates.
Welcome back. Constitution Radio with Douglas V. Gibbs right here on KMET 1490 AM. Don't forget that if you're in the area, you're right here in the Inland Empire. I teach Constitution classes Tuesday nights, Tuesday nights at 6 o'clock in the afternoon or evening, 6 p.m. at All-Star Collision, Car Star, uh, at 522 Railroad Street in Corona. And then on Thursdays, at Faith Armory Gun Shop, 41669 Winchester Road, Temecula, California, except for the second Thursday of the month. I'm right up here in Banning, right here where this station is out of Banning at the Farms House Restaurant on Joshua Palmer Way, right off of the uh, Highland Springs exit off the I-10. That's at 5 o'clock on the second Thursday night of each month with the Banning Beaumont Cherry Valley Tea Party, bbcvteaparty.com. Also, don't forget that in the mornings on Saturdays, I am a co-host on a Banning Beaumont Cherry Valley Tea Party program right here on KMET called Conservative Voice Radio. If you missed it, check out the podcast. Go to Conservative Voice Radio's page on KMET1490AM.com to check out the podcast. If you're not following me on Facebook, I am at Douglas V. Gibbs, or you can also check out my Constitution Study Facebook page has over 11,000 followers. And for that matter, since you're going to be on Facebook anyway, follow KMET on Facebook. So find KMET 1490 AM on Facebook and follow the station. A lot of good information there for you, San Gregorio Pass residents. Also, uh, next Saturday after the radio program, Constitution Association dinner meeting at Myrna's Cafe in Menifee. John Hancock will be the speaker with his Distortion of History presentation. Learn more at constitutionassociation.com. And also, uh, I didn't hand out the uh, phone number for today's program uh, yet uh, because, well, we just had a lot to talk about, to be honest with you. But I definitely want you to call in. I want you to join the conversation. 951-922-3532. For those of you who are still trying to write it down, 9 Five one area code nine two two thirty five thirty two. All right, join us on the program. With me on the program right now is Alex, as always, my commie hunter, and my good friend Dennis Jackson, who also uh, is here um, as as a voice for the Enemies Within movie, enemieswithinmovie.com. And also want to make a reminder to people that um, if you have any mortgage, uh, uh, any mortgage needs when it comes to getting a loan, check out Wholesale Capital Corporation. Wholesale Capital Corporation, they have the loan for you. All right, here we go. It is time for the liberal left's penalty for dissent. I was talking about this just a second ago, and it's fascinating. Let's let's start with, well, let, let, let's present it this way. Religious extremists can be violent, right? Got the Islamic extremists, they're violent. You've got the um, uh, terrorists in Ireland fighting between, you know, the Catholics and the and and the Protestants, you know. And some people can say that there's an extremist nature to the, that uh, of violence. Let's see what what else. Uh, let's see what what other extremist violence have we seen? Oh, I, I I've got one: Pro- progressive extremists and environmental extremists. That's religious in nature too, isn't it? Because it is their religion to be far far left. And for extremists, the consequences of dissent is often death. At the University of Alabama, Huntsville, it seems that climatologist John Christie is an enemy of the liberal left progressive climate change hoax purveyors tyranny. He dares to be a skeptical, a skeptic of the climate change religion. And so his penalty could have been death, but the shooter missed. Shots were fired at the fourth floor of the Science and Technology Center at the University of Alabama, Huntsville, hitting windows adjacent to the climatologist John Christie's office. Three bullets hit windows, while four hit the side of the National Space Science and Technology Center. An incident report was filed after building staff discovered shards of glass Monday morning. Christie is a well-respected climatologist who spent decades using satellites to measure global temperatures. He is considered a, 
quote unquote skeptic of man-made global warming and environmentalists and leaning left scientists have attacked him for challenging their credibility of climate models. Christie's research has shown climate models massively overpredicted global warming. He's also shown extensive research into flaws with surface-based temperature readings from weather stations. And while police say the shooting looks to be random, Christie's colleague, Dr. Roy Spencer, said it's more than coincidence that shots were fired around Earth Day. Given that this was Earth Day weekend, uh, with a March for Science passing right past the building on Saturday, Spencer wrote that he thinks this is more than simply coincidence. When some people cannot argue facts, Spencer wrote on his blog, they resort to violence to get their way. It doesn't matter that we don't deny that we don't deny global warming. The fact we disagree with its seriousness and the level of human involvement in warming is enough to send some radicals into a tizzy. Our street is fairly quiet, so I doubt the shots were fired during Saturday's march here. It was probably late night Saturday or Sunday for the shooter to have a chance of being unnoticed, Spencer noted. All right, so that's penalty for dissent number one. Guys, what do you think? Uh, let's start with you, uh, Dennis. We've got the global warming skeptic, the climate change hoax skeptic. I don't know. What do you want to call him? Uh, he dares to believe that uh, human uh, interference with um, temperature changes are not as drastic as the liberal left would like you to think. And he may be a target for death and termination because of it. What do you think? Well, again, it just goes back to the other things we were talking about earlier where, you know, they change history, kill history, and um, the people that try to write history to silence them as well. But um, I have wanted to see for probably the last four or five years, uh, politically it may never happen, but I think it'd be interesting to have uh, in a theater, televised, whatever, uh, you know, a, a, a debate where uh, Al Gore and all these guys, the scientists, not just the uh, speaking, talking uh, um, uh, celebrity people, but have it take a day or two days. Uh, have it on a Saturday and a Sunday and uh, have it organized, have the subject matter organized and let a guy come up and present his data, you know, for five or 10 or 15 minutes and then have somebody who wants to challenge him there and point out other data and just go back and forth so that, you know, we don't get one guy getting up saying all of his stuff with maybe fabricated well, no, but, but, but information but what we're told on the left. No, the science is settled. There's a consensus. Well, but, well, but it, it's not settled. There are people out there, like the guy you were just talking about, that disagree. And, you know, if you're correct, you know, uh, truth shouldn't bother you. And just have a healthy debate. I mean, I, I don't know all things concerning this. I have my gut feel reaction. I do think that a lot of the environmental concern is to shut down uh, certain industries to uh, uh, economically harm and uh, redistribute uh, 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 monies, uh, you know, throughout the world and, and have the U.S. pay and other people get. But you know, just put them on the same stage, but what, what they don't get on the same stage. You know, they're afraid to talk to the other people. All right, go ahead, Alex. Of, yeah, what, what makes you think that the anarchists are going to allow a debate to take place? They're going to stop it. Well, yeah, I mean, it goes back would, to Ann Coulter, right? Uh, she, she just, she, uh, Ann Coulter had you know, planned a speech at UC Berkeley uh, after Young America's, uh, uh, you know, well, foundation had been sponsoring her. Well, they pulled their support for the event because of threats of violence. And and uh, even Ann Coulter, who I, I figured if anybody was going to stand up to the Berkeley bullies and give a speech, even she was shut down. Well, well she quit because the people who were supporting her pulled the support. But to, to Alex's point, and I would agree with it, that people would fight it, but if you were to be able to find some decent people, honest people, to honestly believe the one side and honestly believe the other, to put them together, and then if the anarchists try to shut it down in protest, well, then they're revealing their hand. And I think people that are kind of undecided well, are not revealing their hand, one way or the, the other. The liberal left is cheering them on. Well, when you have a revolution, there are stages. Uh, the first stage is organizing and, and building your cadres and stuff, carrying signs. The second stage is, is, is violence. 
and we've apparently entered the second stage. I, I fear for, for Trump's health. Well, uh, and, and to Coulter, she, uh, in her, a series of tweets that she uh, put out there after her, she had to cancel her, uh, after sh uh, she had canceled the event, she said a number of things. Uh, number one, I looked over my shoulder and my allies had joined the other team. Then uh, she said that she was so sorry for free speech crushed by thugs. And then finally, it's sickening when a radical thuggish institution like Berkeley can so easily snuff out the cherished American right to free speech. Well, isn't that what they're trying to do when it comes to climate change as well? It's the same stuff all the way across the board. Any scientist who, who backs uh, the, the, the skepticism is going to be attacked financially and, and professionally. Uh, and if they don't go yep. down that way, they'll be violently attacked. That's it. It's the move to a second stage. And this is what and this is what the left does. And this goes back to my very, very first statements beginning of this program. Could you of you who do this, would your mother and God approve? Oh wait, God doesn't exist to these people, so there we go. Uh and they probably think their mom is a, a radical anyway. The the thing is, it's so obvious in common sense terms that what they're doing is tyrannical. And they respond, yeah, but you're wrong, so you must be silenced. Well, isn't that what the Nazis taught? That anybody who opposed them was wrong, so they must be silenced? Isn't that what the communists and Soviet Union and China and Pol Pot and Cambodia and all that taught? Hey, if you disagree with us, you're wrong and you must be silenced? Is, is it not the same thing as the tyranny and the totalitarian systems that have killed through genocide, millions. Isn't it the exact same mentality? Well, you'll Gentlemen? notice you'll notice that there are uh, some uh, Bernie signs on bumpers and lawns, and have been for, through the election, but mm -hmm. almost no Trump signs. And the and the reason is quite simple: uh, people are aware that they're liable they're liable to have violence done to them simply because they expressed that thought. Well, now, you know, it's funny because I've been wanting to put a, a, a Trump sticker on my car again, and I haven't. And my, my stickers right now are faded, so I'm getting ready to, and I'm thinking about putting it on just in time to go to tomorrow's event out there in Riverside. And uh, during the election I did for a while, and, uh, and I remember talking to a lady during the campaign season and she said to me, oh, I'm not going to put a Trump bumper sticker on my car. I, I, you know, someone will key my car. My reaction was, are you kidding me? The founding fathers are willing to put on the line their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, and you're worried about a paint job? I mean, we don't have the – and Alex, I'm dead serious. We don't have the stomach to defend liberty anymore. I have no answer to that. What about you, Dennis? Do we have the stomach? Oh, well, some do. A, a lot of people uh, uh, do not. You know, we've we've talked about uh, uh, how uh, you know the the uh, the churches, you know, have been somewhat silenced either due to their misunderstanding of uh, their tax-free status and what they can or can't say. You have people that, uh, as uh, we've talked about, uh, based upon their vocation, that they'd be in Hollywood or if they'd be in the uh, universities, that if they say their piece, that, you know, they wind up uh, losing their job or losing their ability to, you know, progress in their jobs. Um, but as we continue to have this division between, I'll call it, uh, you know, light and darkness, uh, each passing year, uh, the behavior will get worse and worse, and people will be forced to choose. I mean, eventually the people that are sitting on the sidelines are going to get sucked into it because it will be affecting them uh, right now instead of next year or, you know, next generation. Um, and it's always better to uh, start correcting, you know, uh, your uh, direction before you're at the end of the road. Um, and the American people did that with this last election. But, again, like we said earlier, the Congress needs to get going so we can really uh, attack these things. And if the people we elect don't do it, 
then you kind of lose your fire to do it on your own. Which well, is- uh, well, it's easy to do it with an election, though, because uh, the uh, ones who want to harm you don't see how you voted. But how do you get these people who voted for Donald J. Trump to do more than just vote? Because we're not a democracy. We're a republic, and a republic requires yeah. a lot more work by the citizens than a democracy. It's not just about voting. Voting alone does not, not get back on a constitutional track. Well, yeah, it's the eternal vigilance. You have to, and you have to be diligent day in and day out. Um, but when you have the press and others that are always beating you up, you know, and they, right. they're doing that to uh, depress you, to get you to quit. And then well, yeah, because, you know, you become weary, man, quitting. and you get beat up enough, eventually you don't want to get hit in the face anymore. I get it, but you know what? Sometimes that's what it takes, get beat up. And and if anything, see, here's our problem, though, because you're talking about the media attacking. We're always on defense. We're always reacting. Why don't we go out there and pick the fight? Why don't we go out there and pick a fight and say, hey, we are going to pick this fight because we want to return our nation to constitutional principles. What are we willing to do? What fights are we willing to pick to make America constitutional again? That's a tough question, I know, because it's a, it's a scary thing. Now, there are uh, things going on that are kind of picking fights and trying to get America constitutional again. One of them is that Texas has passed legislation enabling them to nullify uh, unconstitutional federal law. Another one is Trump's idea about dismantling the Ninth Circuit. And I'm going to talk about both of those in a minute at the bottom of the hour. But before I get to that, I want to get to Alex here because Alex has been working his way through a book, uh, giving us not only information about the book, but also his own personal commentary on the subject matter regarding the book and and regarding the topics that surround the book. And so once again, Alex, uh, what's the name of the book and who's the author that we're talking about today? The book is Political Pilgrims, Tales of Travels of Western Intellectuals to the Soviet Union, China, and Cuba by Paul Hollander. All right. Now, this this book, this gentleman has traveled to his communist countries. He's been around it. He's telling his tale. So there is, just like this book, there is plenty of information out there about the failures of communism and the dangers of communism, of socialism, of that kind of big government thinking. You will notice that none of those uh, subjects is covered in TV shows, movies, or uh, high schools today or colleges. Right. Well, uh, I, you know, they're I, erasing, they're erasing I, I want to see I want to see a college professor issue that book as required reading material. They're re, they're erasing that history. It's not done. It's not. Oh, you mean not, like the Confederacy? They're doing whatever they can to erase exactly what doesn't agree with them. Exactly. Absolutely. Uh, the uh, the the conservative believes what he sees. The liberal sees what he believes. Well, he gets, he, it looks good on paper, so therefore it's going to work. He gets very rattled when somebody uh, obscures his his uh, uh, fantasy vision. Mm-hmm. Utopianism, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, what I'm dealing with, I got. See, I, I try to stay within the covers of the book, but life is connected, you know. Right. And there are there are. This book happens to be uh, especially uh, difficult for a reviewer because it presents the communist attitude with very little uh, criticism, very little pushback. The book assumes that the person who's reading it understands what kind of a monster Stalin was. All right, but, so, so what you're saying is the, the book stays away from commentary and pretty much just lays <laughs> out the facts, what, what facts they saw, what they experienced, that kind of thing. What they, what they said, mostly. Okay. Uh, now, you got a, a, a guy... You hear the, the leftists talking peace and love, and they're constantly accusing the conservatives of violence and all this kind of stuff. But buried in here, among all these pilgrims, and by the way, these pilgrims uh, amounted to hundreds of influential Americans who went there and got suckered, went to the right. Soviet Union. 
the reason Stalin was able to murder tens of millions of his own people, the reason he was able to, to torture people and starve them with impunity is because these people went back and told America that he was a, a wonderful guy. Uh, they are responsible, uh, if anybody on this earth is responsible for the hundred million that died during the 20th century, they're the ones. Okay. Now, one of the one of the things that I wanted to cover before I, I actually got into the uh, political pilgrims was the the fellow that called in uh, last week. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, Ed, Ed from Wildemar called in and said basically that uh, the communists didn't steal everything uh, from us, uh, or or all of their technology wasn't stolen. That they you know came up with their own technology. Gene, he gave us a list of some of the things. Yeah, well, that may be, but the amount of, uh, like I say, uh, I've got a, a book by, uh, 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 the, the, the book uh, Secrets, uh, which was, I can't remember the guy's name right now, but it, it's definitive and it's a, it's a Democrat senator. Uh, right. He, he says that they stole every secret we had. Every political, industrial, military, the American Communist Party. So, so what, really, what you're saying is everything they had may not have been stolen, but everything we had, they stole from us. Exactly. Uh, okay. So you, and, and it's not that there, there weren't geniuses in Russia. You had the guy Kalashnikov. In 1947, he invented a rifle that is incomparable. It, it, there's, there's, there's no rifle like it. It's it, a factor of 10 in terms of the number that are, are in use. It's, it's on a flag of a country. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget the name of the because some African countries got the Kalashnikov on, on that flag. But the same year, uh, they, they introduced the uh, Tupolev Tu-4 four-engine bomber. Uh, what happened was that they captured three... They, it's tricky that they, would, or they as an ally would capture, but they were neutral at the time, uh, supposedly. They... they captured three uh, B-29 bombers, and they reverse-engineered them. They took them apart piece by piece and made thousands of drawings and all this kind of stuff. When they had the first one built, uh, a, a, a visitor said to them, why is there a, if that's a brand new plane, why is there a patch on the fuselage? And they said, uh, Stalin said he wanted an exact copy of this airplane. This airplane has a patch on it. He gets, he gets an exact copy. You don't, you don't uh, second guess Stalin. Okay. Now their big problem with that airplane, by the way, was that they couldn't produce the tires. They they had the technology to, to to make everything in the airplane, except they couldn't make the tires. So they had to go out on the on the surplus market and buy it indirectly from the United States. Uh, they they did this kind of stuff. The amount of money that they they saved on on research and development is just incredible. Uh, for instance, they're all, they don't have an automobile that's worth driving. There, there's there's a, a, a German car called a Trabant that was made uh, during communism, and it, it's a two-stroke, uh, mix the oil, pour it under the hood, uh, impossible to drive, no gas gauge, uh, turn, turn signals, don't have indicators. It's, it's just a, a, a garbage. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who's, a, who's a communist bought a Yugo from Yugoslavia. And he had to sell it right away because it was such a dog, he couldn't get anywhere. Uh, they, 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 what they did was they, they got a hold of a 1942 Packard Super 8, and they reverse engineered that. And they called it a, a Zill or a Zis or whatever it was. They made uh, uh, 2,000 of the things, but that, it wasn't Russian technology. It was stolen technology. Uh, the, the fat man bomb that we dropped, I think it was on Hiroshima, one or the other. That one, they, they, they stole, the, the American Communist Party stole the, 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 the design for that to the point where I have a picture in a, in a book where the, the, the two of them are, are, two pictures are side by side, and they are identical. And it's, a, it's an extremely idiosyncratic bomb. It's not like any old bomb. It's, 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 it's almost round. It's, it's, it's got all kinds of features on it, and they are identical. So these mm -hmm. people stole uh, shamelessly, 
and then we have somebody telling me that, that they didn't. Uh, yeah, re re real quick, I just want to insert this for the listeners who are wondering. Uh, when you had mentioned earlier there was a flag in Africa that had the uh, Russian gun on it, uh, the flag of Mozambique, uh, adopted in May 1, uh, 83, includes an image of an AK-47 with a bayonet attached to the barrel. And it's one of only two national flags of United Nations member states to feature a firearm, the other one being Guatemala. Well, I got a I got a guy here named Maurice. Uh, the problem is we don't know who these people are. It's been uh, dozens of years, and uh, they weren't that that famous. Every one of them to start with, but this Maurice Indus, an American author and specialist on the Soviet Union, wrote, "quote And supposing there is a famine in Russia, what will happen? People will die, of course. And supposing three or four million people die." The revolution will go on. Uh, well, actually, it makes that, the revolution easier because the less people there are, the easier they are to control, right? Well, it, it's it's as far as he's concerned, it's worth it. So, so millions of, of innocent people die. So what? Uh, you got you you, it, you you want to make an omelet? You got to break some eggs. That's their attitude. It's it's right. it's sociopathic. You got Sinclair, uh, excuse me, Upton Sinclair, who's supposed to be a big moralist author, a muckraker. Uh, he also succeeded in per persuading himself that the famine and the violence associated with the collectivization of agriculture in the early 1930s was necessary to avert greater evils in the future. Quote, they drove rich peasants off the land and sent them wholesale to work in lumber camps and rail on railroads. Maybe it cost a million lives. Maybe it cost five million. But you cannot think intelligently about it unless you ask yourself how many millions it might have cost if the changes had not been made. He added, some people will say that this looks like condoning wholesale murder. That is not true. It is merely trying to evaluate a revolution. There has never been in human history a great social change without killing. The French Revolution cost millions. Well, in fact, it didn't cost millions, but the, the violence that it engendered was, was horrible. Uh, the, 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 this, this is much like when I talk to people about the $22 trillion that we've sent, spent on social programs and the war on on poverty, and I say there hasn't been any change in the rate of poverty in the United States after $22 trillion, and they, they say, well, think of how bad it would be if we hadn't spent that money. Now, <laughs> earlier you had mentioned uh, someone, Maurice Halperin, is that who it was? Uh, Maurice uh, Hindus. Oh, okay, it's a different Maurice. Okay, because Maurice Halperin was who I thought you said, and he was an accused Soviet spy. Yeah, well, that's a, a different Maurice. You got to watch out for those Maurices; they'll get you every time. <laughs> yeah. So, so Maurice, who is it? Maurice who? Uh, Hindus, H-I-N-D-U-S. And like I say, these are these are not all uh, superstars. And even if they were, it's been 50, 60, 70, 80 okay, years. Okay. Okay. So, so Maurice Hindus was uh, originally Russian, and he was born in Russia, rather than the other Maurice being an American went Russian on us. I don't know whether he was born in Russia or not. I don't think so. Yeah, well, uh, according to Maurice uh, Hendis' uh, information, now that I've looked him up, he was born in uh, Belarus in ah. 1891, died in New York City in 1969, and he was a Russian-American writer, foreign correspondent, lecturer, and authority on Soviet and Central European affairs. Yeah, authority on how to lie about it. Okay. Uh, now, I'll take an example. Uh, there's, there, we've talked about the left. Take the right. you got a guy named Herbert Hoover. He was president. Okay. Uh, uh, before, well, I, I the, wouldn't say he was on the right, but go ahead. In the 1920s, uh, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. In the 1920s, <laughs> he was president of the United States, okay? Right. And the, the uh, Depression hit. He was blamed for the Depression. They called the, the hobo jungles Hoovervilles. They vilified this guy. They, 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 nobody but, but Richard Nixon and Joe McCarthy have been attacked and, and, and slandered the way this guy has. And it, yeah. it's another example of the left turning reality upside down and inside out. Right. Uh, well, I mean, and, and Herbert Hoover, for let me real quick, if I may insert this, he was not the most conservative Republican, but he was a Republican, and he followed behind Calvin Coolidge, and he won the presidency because of Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge was probably the best president, well, not probably was, the um, most effective uh, president 
of the 20th century. He, uh, he had very conservative uh, opinions. He was very constitutional. And what resulted from his presidency was the uh, most prosperous decade in the history of the United States, the Roaring Twenties. Uh, when Herbert Hoover won the presidency after Coolidge's two terms, based on the fact they had an R after his name, Hoover was not as much of a conservative, and he began to increase uh, increase public works projects on a federal level and 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 re return to, to raising some taxes, things like that. So he wasn't the most conservative guy, but he wasn't a complete liberal left progressive either. Okay. Um, but nonetheless, Herbert Hoover's activities, while not helpful to the American economy, was not what caused the uh, Depression, but it was a great opportunity for the progressives to blame a Republican because that was who was in office when it all collapsed. Uh, if you look back in history, uh, there was a, a combination of a few things uh, that resulted in the Depression, the primary cause being, well, the Federal Reserve itself and its printing of money. Uh, then what exacerbated the uh, uh, Depressionary times was a uh, tariff war that was created by Smoot-Hawley, uh, a, a devastating uh, okay, Her uh, trade Her act. Herbert Hoover was, was, was slandered. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. And it says here that he, uh, in fact, saved more lives than anyone in history heading the American Relief Administration feeding starving Russians, Russians in 1921, according to right. a PBS documentary written by Cynthia Haven, produced by Bertrand Pettenrod. In World War I, Herbert Hoover helped feed 7 million Belgians under German occupation. This was expanded to 21 countries under the ARA. Russia was in chaos with 16 million facing starvation. This was exacerbated by the previous government requisitioning of grain. 100,000 died every week of starvation. The total came to 10 million. They had to post guards at cemeteries to keep the starving from eating corpses. Wow. Congress, yeah. Congress, that, that's, that that's, sounds like Venezuela today. It, it's, the, it's the communists looking out for the little guy. They always say they're looking out for the little guy. That's so they can carve him and cook him. Uh, Congress authorized 20 million for, for relief. Now here's a, how many times has Russia uh, raised 20 million dollars for, for to help America? Right. They fed 11 million kids per, people per day and hired 120,000 Soviet citizens. They also supplied seed, which the Russians had also taken away. Official histories accused relief workers of spying and sabotage. In other words, as soon as as the uh, the emergency was over. Stalin had his people vilify the, the relief workers. Those who were Russian were put in the gulag for, for saving lives. Uh, it, it just, it's just got to be. Uh, the, the, the hypocrisy is, is unbelievable. Uh, you got, you got uh, Stalin put together a program uh, where they were crossbreeding humans with apes. It sounds impossible, but Google it. Ilya Ivan Ivanov uh, died in 1932, ran Stalin's program to breed humans with apes to, to create a hybrid super soldier. Ivan Pavlov wrote his obituary. Uh, it, wow. it, as it happened, it didn't work. But that's the kind of monsters that we're talking about here. <sighs> anyway, I get, I get real upset and... Uh, and again, it, it's 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 hard to skip over any of this stuff. You got yeah, you're the resident commie hunter. You have so much to say and so little time to do it. I get it. Yeah, there was a guy named Lavarenti Beria uh, talking about the, the the morality of of the government under Stalin. Uh, it turns out that wherever the Russian soldier goes, goes rape. They love to rape people. Were these gulags when the women? Well, now let's, up... let's stop right there. When uh, we we were in the waning days of World War II, yeah. and the West was moving towards uh, Berlin, the the you know United States, the British troops, and the Russians were moving towards yeah. Berlin from the east. What was going on in Poland was uh, in, uh, the Soviet soldiers were raping the women as they moved through the territories. They did the same thing in Berlin when, when Eisenhower left them, because FDR told them. Uh, right. Now, them. now, this wasn't, now, now, understand, folks, this problem 
of of the women being raped by the soldiers was not a widespread epidemic problem when it came to the British or American troops. Were there cases? I'm I, I'm I'm willing to bet there were. But was this a widespread academic epidemic? No. But when it's it came to the policy. Soviet troops, it was. Yeah. Uh, and, and 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 now is that. Now, now I'm, I, I bring that up because I want to ask you this because you just brought this up. It happened in other instances too when it came to the Soviets. Is is this the result of the godlessness of the system or result of the when, trend when you don't, of when you don't you know, lack of God, humanity? When you don't believe in God and you have no morality and you're horny and you're an ugly fat bastard like this like this Labyrinthi Beria who was the head of the secret police. Uh, it's real easy to get in your Zill automobile and ride around Moscow. And when you see a girl on the sidewalk that, that, that tickles your fancy, you stop the car, you have your secret police grab her, they drag her to this guy's office, he rapes her repeatedly, and then when she leaves, she knows that she better not say anything about it. Because or she's dead. Not only, not only she, but her family is in trouble. Uh, well, yeah, you know, it sounds almost like Islam, except for in the case of Islam, she would then be blamed for the rape. So, so in in the meantime, uh, 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 you you got prisons that what we I think we talked about this a little bit before. Uh, crime, crime in the Marxist view arises from the conflicts of, of a class exploiting society. Uh, mm -hmm. Hindus, same Hindus guy, uh, he, he says the Soviets are acting on the assumption that it is not the criminal who is under obligation to society. Uh, Ella Winter, but the society that's under obligation to the criminal. Uh, Ella Winter says the criminal is not a criminal. The society is. Well, I got news for you. Uh, and I got a lot more quotes than that, but uh, I'm probably running out of time. Yeah, uh, you are, but it, go ahead. It has occurred to me that because these people that we are facing off with here in the United States are Marxists, uh, they look at, at criminality the same way. Back in the days of Angela Davis, uh, it, was, it was the same idea. The reason, according to these Marxists, the reason that there's crime is because people have more money than other people. Right. Everything's economic. Well, as a matter of fact, Karl Marx believed that religion also was uh, created by uh, economics. Economics was, you know, behind everything. So what you en what you end up with is we have to have a communist society in order to get rid of crime. Now, if you look at real communist societies, you find that the only thing that keeps the crime down is the totalitarian. Uh, uh, belligerence of the government, but in terms of of, of the amount of crime they still e experience, it, it's it's enormous. Uh, this well, is this is the crime nonsense. committed by the government. Yeah. Pardon? Uh, in the communist countries, you don't have to worry about uh, public crime because you have the government committing the crime. The whole the whole government is is built on. <laughs> On, that's that's right. Uh, on on uh, yeah. secret police, you know all that stuff. You know, you got uh, aware of the in iniquities under the system of, of Stalin. Well, I've got Which, a couple more things I want to talk about, Alex. So uh, wrap it all up. All right, I'll tell you what. I'll I'll, I'll wrap it up now. But uh, this is get, let's get three more hours. All right. <laughs> What does guy get you your own show? There's a uh, <laughs> there's a thought. <laughs> I like that. Well, you know, the thing is, there's so much to talk about, yeah, because history, and this goes back to the very, very beginning of this program. Those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. These are important things for us to know. These are important things for us to run to to learn. I have Alex on this program and talking about these things for a reason. If we're not going to hear this, if we're not going to learn from this are doomed to repeat it that's just reality and right now when it comes to u.s constitution and i believe the u.s constitution was an inspired document and that the system is not antiquated it's a very very 
uh, effective system of government that has been tw tweaked in such a way that it's having trouble uh, working properly, not because of the original Constitution, but because of the tweaks that have been committed against it. I wouldn't and call them tweaks. Go, go, go ahead, Dennis. Are there more than tweaks? Well, yeah, there, there are more than tweaks, but that's the word that came to mind. You know, it goes back to yeah. my analogy about the broken-down vehicle in the driveway, yeah. and, you know, you got the tools in the garage to fix it, you, but you haven't read the owner's manual, so you grab your you grab your wrenches, you go out there, you start turning stuff and whatever, and you're probably doing more damage than good, not knowing how it's supposed to properly function. But if you go read the owner's manual and you get out there and get under the hood, uh, you may, uh, when it comes to the Constitution, here's what you realize. Not only is the engine not running properly, there's stuff missing. Mm -hmm. There is stuff that have been actually just removed. Now, one of those things have been removed. Uh, one of the things that, that we haven't been really seeing much is state sovereignty, states' rights, states taking control of their um, of their rights as the as the parents over the federal government. Uh, well, now the delegates, san sanctuary city has changed that. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's going to change it real. Well, dele the delegates of the Constitutional, uh, uh, Constitutional Convention back in 1787, they were there representing the states to create the federal government to serve the states and handle the external issues, not what's going on inside the states, not to rule over the states or interfere with internal issues regarding the life, liberty, and properties of the people, or to disrupt the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state, but to handle the external issues to protect the union, such as war, such as trade, and so on and so forth, trade routes. And so as the authors of the U.S. Constitution, the states are the parents over the federal government and the final arbiters of what is constitutional or not constitutional. And if a law is deemed unconstitutional by a state, as per Thomas Jefferson in his draft of the Kentucky Resolutions in 1798, the state may nullify that law. Here's the quote, where powers are assumed which have not been delegated, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy. In other words, a state has the right to say, you know what? That federal law is unconstitutional, so we're not going to implement it. And now, th th those who want to argue with me will say, wait a second, Article 6, Doug, uh, Supremacy Clause says the federal government, uh, federal law is, you know, supreme over all state laws. That's not what it says. The reality is the clause says all, fe it doesn't say that all federal laws take precedence over all state laws. It says that U.S. laws made in pursuance of the Constitution are the supreme law of the land, and state laws cannot be the contrary of those laws made in pursuance of the U.S. Constitution. And so now we've got Texas out there. They've decided enough is enough. They, they're, they're nullifying, they're ready to start nullifying unconstitutional federal laws. The Republicans in the Texas legislature just passed, or proposed, it hasn't passed yet, the Texas Sovereignty Act, which calls for nullification of unconstitutional federal laws. And, it's, and it says that they want to prohibit future overreach of the federal government. And in addition to, Arizona already has an approved uh, similar policy. And uh, there's also um, other states that have uh, followed suit, and I'll give you the list in a minute. Um, uh, uh, and among the targets of nullification will be, no doubt in my mind, the federal requirement through the court decisions regarding the legalization of gay marriage. Constitutionally, the courts have no legislative authorities in the first place, so their rulings can legally make something legal, legal just like uh, Roe v. Wade, legalization of abortion. Nullify it. It's unconstitutional. You know, we've got um, Madison in Federalist 45 said, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. Another issue targeted will probably be voter ID laws. The, the federal courts state that uh, 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 they're illegal based on the voting rights. Act, the unconstitutional law that disallows states from changing their manners and procedures regarding elections without congressional approval, which targets southern states, by the way, which which exhibits preferential treatment to the other states. Uh, yeah, baloney. The U.S. Supreme Court has voided nearly all of Texas's uh, uh, 2013 abortion law, so you know, um, you know, the, the Texas is going to nullify that. Uh, the Arizona law passed in 2014 allows the state to withdraw its resources from enforcing federal laws uh, it deems unconstitutional. 
Uh, the other states, by the way, that have uh, nullification laws are either on the books or they've proposed them are Oklahoma, Maine, and Idaho as well. Uh, they propose uh, similar legislation this year. Can I, can I says, hey, we're going to nullify. Go ahead. Can I, can I for, a, for a minute, go back to the law regarding my subject today? Uh, you'll notice that... Was well, there a tie-in to what I'm saying? Uh, maybe. It, it, it's... The, the, they're passing all these laws to let prisoners out of jail. Right. And and the result is that, that we're being flooded with felons. And, of course, they lie about the quality of the of the, the cases that these people had against them and, the, and their offenses and all that. Well, the ruling class is full of felons. So one of those felons wanted to be president of the United States, but she got beat defeated. But the, 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 the point is that it, it makes sense. If you understand that the Marxist believes that the criminal is the victim, that society has imposed its capitalist, uh, inhuman uh, system on the, the criminal, and the criminal has, has lashed out. As a consequence, not only does, the, does the, the person convicted of a crime have a right to be outside of jail, but really, if they attack your, your wife or your daughter or, or, or you on your way to work, uh, you deserve it. Well, yeah, because it's the fault of the system. It's the fault of the Constitution. It's the fault of capital. It's the fault of economics. It's not their fault. They didn't have a choice. Uh, they're just reacting to their situation imposed upon them by an economic system that allows some people to do better than others. The, ultimately, that's the Marxist idea. And I'm here to tell you when it comes to the U.S. Constitution and this idea of nullification by Texas is not only – are we all uh, able to do better than others? So are the states. And if the state says, you know what, we're not going to allow the federal government to dictate to us to try to make us exactly like each other or to penalize us uh, for doing well, we're going to nullify those federal laws. And we're going to do what we're going to do because we want to, because we're this is an individualistic society. And my placement in life and my placement on the totem pole has nothing to do with the economic system and everything to do with my own economic decisions and my own legal decisions and my own uh, decisions uh, in the sense of incentive for whatever I do. And that, that ultimately is what it's coming down to. And basically what you're presenting here, uh, Alex, and what I'm presenting and how they're similar, these topics, which don't seem to be as similar to others, is that it comes down to one thing, individual versus collectivism. And the problem is the collectivist, the communist that you're talking about in your presentation uh, regarding that book and all of that, is that the collectivist believes that the collective is more important than the individual. And the collective will survive as long as the individual stop being individuals. That the individual desire of peoples and the opportunities that they they want to change is dangerous to the collective. And therefore the collective, the good of the community, the collective good must be protected. Resistance is futile. And so what they've done to make sure that happens is they've forced the states and they forced the peoples into this system that is anything but constitutional. And in reality, really, their biggest weapon has been the courts. And, and it's been so bad with the courts, uh, Trump isn't even getting, able to get anything done because the courts have been attacking him. Well, Obama it, packed it. Well, Obama packed it. Seventy percent of the federal court system is, is liberal. Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution says Congress uh, uh, had the authority and has the authority to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. Our, in Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution, referring to the inferior federal courts, it states that it's Congress who may from time to time ordain and establish. Uh, so with the power of creation comes the power to dismantle. The Ninth Circuit of Appeals has been neglecting the rule of law. What they do when they neglect to apply the law and instead apply their opinions to laws is push the rule of man rather than the rule of law. And leftist judges have been ruling unconstitutionally based on their ideological beliefs rather than applying the law to the cases they hear. So in response to their illegal rulings, of which the courts have no authority to enforce, President Trump said he is considering proposals that would split up the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, first came the attacks on his travel ban, and then we've got... Uh, and then more recently, uh, his uh, wanting to not give money to sanctuary cities and states. And now that's been stopped uh, by courts. And, and my first thought is this. Um, I, I, I seem to rem 
as, as for the well, when it comes to the funding, it's up to the regulatory agencies and all. But when it comes to the judicial branch's lack of enforcement authorities, why is Trump even arguing with them? Ignore the courts. What are they going to do? How are they going to force their rulings? Regarding the sanctuary cities, uh, by the way, in Article 6 of the United States Constitution, the Supremacy Clause I was talking about a moment ago, it states that laws contrary to constitutional U.S. laws are unconstitutional, and the judges are, shall be bound thereby. So, in short, sanctuary status laws are illegal. Sanctuary cities have no legal leg to stand on from the point of view of constitutionality. That all said, w just tell the courts to buzz off. It's like uh, Andrew Jackson uh, said to John Marshall after he ruled against him in the Worcester case back in the 1830s. All right, J uh, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let's see him enforce it. It was a dare because they, can't, they have no, no enforcement arm. What are they going to do if Trump says, okay, court, you said what you said. Now I'm going to do this, <clears throat> and I'm not listening to you. What are they going to do? That all said, dismantling the Ninth Circuit Court is doable, but not by the executive branch. If the judges need to be removed from their seats and the court dismantled, the Congress would have to initiate the move with legislation. Article 3's exception clause, Congress also has the authority to use legislation to make null and void unconstitutional rulings. One wonders why they haven't used that tool instead. And if one reads the Constitution and understands the history of the courts, we realize two things. First, the judicial branch was originally supposed to be the weakest branch of the three, not the strongest. Second, uh, among Congress's jobs is to be a check against the courts. The courts are not supposed to be a check against the president and Congress. The checks against the executive and legislative branches are supposed to be the states and we the people. In short, all of these rulings by the court against judges, against Trump's executive orders, are an overstepping of their judicial authorities. They are acting illegally, and they need to be dismantled by Congress for it, and we're out of time. Gentlemen, plug yourself. Okay, uh conservativecanonade.org. I want you to notice the, the poem in there, uh, Who Put the Rat in Democrat. It's 18 good pages of, of wonderful writing. There are 320 separate rhymes in it. It's impossible to do, but but I did it. you gotta, you got to check it out, people. Uh, and there's a blog attached to it, we're, we're, and he's, he's getting ready to really take off with that. All right, Dennis, plug yourself. Enemieswithinmovie.com. And uh, thanks, for uh, gentlemen, for you being on the show with me. Uh, we had a lot to go through. And, man, I tell you what, we went two hours, and now two hours doesn't seem like it's enough. Uh, but I'll remember, folks, united we stand, combined we kick butt. God bless America, and God bless you. Thanks for listening to the program. We will see you here next Saturday right here on KMET 1490 AM. And don't forget, 8 AM next Saturday morning, Conservative Voice Radio also. And, of course, always visit politicalpistachio.com to read what I write. See you next week. Have a good week. The proceeding was a paid program. Views and claims expressed are those of the program producer and are not endorsed by this station. Opinions expressed are not necessarily those of radio station KMET, its management, employees, or affiliates. Serving the Inland Empire and desert communities, this is 1490 AM KMET, Banning, Beaumont, Redlands, and Palm Springs. From ABC News, I'm Chuck Severson. Organizers say this People's Climate March in Washington, D.C. numbers about 200,000.